three things, three statements that are pertinent, I feel, t for today's um, message came my way, and I just wanted to begin with reading them. This is by somebody named August Gold. I doubt if they were born with that name, but who knows? To enter the conversation with life, we only have to change one key word. We have to stop asking, why is this happening to me? And start asking, why is this happening for me? When we can do this, we're free. Another offering by Thomas Moore, who wrote Care of the Soul some time ago, that was a very pivotal book for me. Many people think that the point of life is to solve their problems and be happy, but happiness is usually a fleeting sensation, and you never get rid of problems. Your purpose in life may be to become more who you are and more engaged with people and the life around you, to really live your life. That sounds obvious, yet many people spend their time avoiding life. They are afraid to let it flow through them, and so their vitality gets channeled into ambitions, addictions, and preoccupations that don't give fulfillment. And then there was one that kind of lightened me up. It's an old Yiddish saying. If you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I might want to put a little flair on that. If you're going through hell, keep going, right? <laughs> Those are all statements that really have to do with healing. And the unity movement at its core is a teaching of healing. Healing is a broad spectrum topic. It is, in one sense, it can be related to the body through maintaining a alkalinity versus an acidity within the body to reduce inflammation and disease. On another level or another tier, I saw the word tier in my mind as I was developing this, another level, that on an emotional level, it's really about releasing and integration. And then on a mental level, another tier, there is a process of cutting the cords from situations and people and circumstances that no longer serve us. So healing, in a sense, is a process of correction, of correcting what we were to what we are. And when I was, um, I'm going to take this off, it's a little, people said to me, earlier, happy summer. Uh, it's a, it is indeed summer. Back in April when we first came, it was a different feeling then for me and for my wife. We were living in North Vancouver in a little carriage house that I called the moving box because it was maybe 500 square feet. And we had all our boxes and suitcases, and we didn't know anybody here yet, and it was, it was um, an interesting time. It was rain, rainy most days, and, and coming into the city, I was listening on the Canadian Broadcast Company um, radio. Some of you were here for that, sharing a song. I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. And I said to myself, I will survive. Not only I will survive, but I will thrive. And that was an affirmation and a proclamation for myself 
in terms of my work here and being with you, that we came here to thrive. And I bring up that situation with Gloria Gaynor because I saw uh, in a magazine just last week something that was entitled Gaynor's Miraculous Recovery. And some of you may be familiar with Gloria Gaynor. She had a lifetime, an early childhood uh, of abuse, and when in 1978 she fell off the stage while performing and broke her neck. And yet, when she came to the studio with a neck brace on, the writer of that song, I Will Survive, looked at her and said, you're the perfect person for this song. And it became an international success, and she's traveled all over the world, and so on. But there's another element to this story that came out of the mist again that I wanted to touch on, and I was deeply moved by it. She said, in the early days, she began partying too hard and lost herself in drugs and alcohol. And one time, 15, she says, 15 of us were sitting in a hotel suite and we were all lying on a carpet, a shag carpet, doing drugs and drinking, when all of a sudden, someone behind me grabbed me, pulled her up off the carpet, and said audibly to her, that's enough. And she turned around, and there was no one there. And she ran into the bathroom, and she cried and cried, and she said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And she stopped doing drugs, she stopped doing alcohol. Another day coming from Delta, where we live now, I was listening to something on the radio. Canadian Broadcast Company is very interesting. I like that station. It links up Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the commentator was stay saying that in in British Columbia alone, last year, there were 400 deaths from opiate use. And across Canada, it's a big problem. And in the eastern seaboard of the United States, it's a big problem. And I asked myself, what, what are people not wanting to experience? What are people running from? And when I asked that question, I went inside and I remember that there was a PBS, public broadcasting special on TV. And there was a man, a doctor, who ran a treatment facility and he, I forget his name, but he was top in his field and he said, the reason for addiction is that people don't want to feel. They don't want to feel life, so they cover it over with drugs. And before I get into that a little bit more, I want to talk about an important conversation I had with a good friend of mine who's a mentor about six, seven years older than me. And he assists me in my conversation around spiritual life. How to continually unfold, how to take this consciousness called me to a higher level, level so that I may be of service to people that I'm in service to. And he said that until we find our purpose in this life, we will wander. We will wander in our wilderness. And that somehow touched me. 
that even the story in, the, in Scripture of the Israelites leaving Egypt and wandering is a story of the self in its process of moving out of sheer physicality awareness or sense consciousness as Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, called it. Out of self, um, sense consciousness and wandering for a time until coming into the promised land. And the promised land is a state of awakening, of the land of milk and honey, which is the land of waking up. But when I read that about Gloria Gaynor, I had this real strong feeling of the Spirit allowing people through their free will to experiment in life and do what they want to do and then yet there is a time when it says that's enough that's enough and it's not like that voice was a lawgiver or some punitive God we really are in a process of moving away from that whole paradigm, right? Moving into a close and personal and loving presence. But to me, that presence that, that grabbed Gloria Gaynor by the collar and lifted her up and said, that's enough, was on the level that was not involved with the tears T-I-E-R-S, the tears or the levels that we deal with. It was on the level of spirit side, a whole nother level, a whole nother tear that saw her. And if it sees her, that guide or representative of that other level, of spirit side, I'll just call it the fourth tier, was caring enough, loving enough, and beholding enough of her to, and she called it, a divine intervention. It saw her as whole and complete, and she was at the end of that level or tier of consciousness. And it, it said, that's enough. And I think about the human path that you and I tread of why we allow ourselves, if it's not drugs or alcohol or opiates, which seems to be a pandemic challenge for humans now. There's a whole lot that we are exposed to, is that not so, in our media that we just don't want to see anymore. But here's the bottom line, or the point. The only way out is through. The only way out is through. And that on a subconscious level or a deeper level, Gloria may have been wanting a way out. But then, after having this experience of that's enough, she had to come to terms with her own life, her own beingness, where she sat and she said, you know, the only way out is through. And if we look at our own life experience, and I have, I've said this before, in the midst of great beauty, I have the honor and privilege to be with people where they're dealing with a whole lot of stuff. I have for many, many years. 
Even when I was a corpsman in the Coast Guard, other Coast Guard people would come to me and talk about their lives. And that was, heck, that was 40 years ago. So a lot of people have come across my, my experience talking about, I would really like to get out of this situation, but the only way out is really through. And that it seems to me that the disconnect, if there is one, is this whole idea around that these tears are, they're connected, but we don't get it. The soul spirit tear is ever present. Isn't that what the teachings say? Of all religions, that the spirit the kingdom of heaven is here and now. The spirit, the kingdom of heaven is within. So what is it that we have to do to allow this to happen? I came across this other writing by a woman. And she says, I was in the country when the power went off during a storm and she was terrified. She remembered the suffocating closeness of an air raid shelter in Tokyo long ago, the sirens and the shocks of the bombing. Still, she made a decision unique for her to go with the fear, to allow herself to be terrified, and with this acceptance came a flooding relaxation, a serenity and ease. And she wrote, I used to feel anxious and fill myself up with unnecessary things so that I didn't have to feel the fear. This time I stayed afraid. It was dizzying. Rather than blaming anyone for my state, I just was frightened. I thought, I'm just frightened. How extraordinary. Being present is like standing on a cliff, exhilarating. I'm getting softer on the outside and stronger on the inside. So what is the good news? The good news for me is that the spiritual world interpenetrates the, the mental and the emotional and the physical world. It interpenetrates it. And it is my assertion that even here in this room, there are those that stand just outside of consciousness that are waiting for us to take it to the next level. I was walking down, well, probably a couple times a week I walk out of here and go down to the Jewish deli that's on the corner. They have great kosher soup. And I was walking down and I was looking at the, the street side and there was so much traffic and so many incredible, I've never seen a city with so many incredible cars. <laughs> Lamborghinis and Ferraris and Porsches and Maseratis and I'm like, wow. But then I was I was like looking at that and I was going, you know, what are people trying to get? They're all wanting to get somewhere and they're all wanting to get something and they're all maybe thinking that they're late and they have to get somewhere really fast. <laughs> but what are we really trying to get? I don't... Maybe it was just me, but most of the time when I'm walking along the street, there isn't a real strong feeling of spiritual presence because of the, the emphasis on things. I'm not making any of that wrong. But when I go into the Jewish deli and I have a bowl of soup and the waitress brings it to my table, she does it with grace. 
And she does it with a remembrance always in her mind of her culture, her Jewish culture that is about hospitality. It's about love. It's about goodness and sharing. And I thought to myself, well, that's why I come here, not just for the soup, but for the hospitality and the goodness of those folks. I want to share with you a um, piece of my history. And I like to do that because I find that people have a relatability with history of others and that we're all mirroring to each other uh, our, through our own lives to each other. About 25 years ago, I was involved in this um, very powerful weekend of self-transformation and this, there was about 40 of us with 10 staff people and they were all, we were all sitting in a big circle. And this woman looks at me, she's three, row, three seats over there, and she looks at me and she, she just says, looking good, going nowhere. And she was a staff person. I didn't know that at first, but she was a staff person. And she said that to trigger me, which set up a whole weekend of fun. <laughs> my internal dialogue, my inner egoic mind said, how dare you, right? But what she wasn't saying it out of malice. She was saying it as a gift. She knew that the way out was the way through. And the whole weekend was one trigger after another. And before she said that, the leader said, I need you to make a vow that you will not leave here during this weekend. We didn't know what was going to happen. I said, okay. I paid my money, you know, the whole thing, right? And then that was her words. But it was about caring enough and taking that risk so that there was a opening within me that wouldn't have happened if that hadn't been said. So it was really a process of reframing. And so, there, you know, you might say, well, that's all fine and good. Well, but how do I reframe my life? How do I move from strictly being in the three lower tiers, so to speak, the physical, the emotional, and mental? How do I allow spirit in more? to divinize, and I use that word during the meditation, divinize, not demonize, divinize, which is allowing more of spirit to infuse the physicalness, the emotions, and the mental, to allow our vessel to be divinized by the spirit that is right there, that was right there as a representative for Gloria Gaynor that said, that's enough. That cares about us. That's just beyond the veil of the senses. Charles Fillmore talks a great deal about sense consciousness and that the opportunity as we are in physicality, in a lifetime, is to divinize these tears of being so that then we become who we actually are, what our purpose is, and we fulfill that purpose while we're here. Well, the reframe that I came to is very, very simple. And I feel that truth needs to be simple. 
the reframe is simply to say, and you may even laugh, God is present versus God is absent. And I know that that may sound like, well, it, that doesn't sound very technical. But this morning, as I was sitting on my couch and I was putting on my shoes, ready to come, I reminded myself, God is present, here and now. And it reminds me of a monk, a story on PBS some years ago. A monk, a Buddhist monk, and he's walking. He's like walking this fast. And then all of a sudden he turns around and goes back and starts all over again. He's walking down a road. Where is he going? Doesn't matter. He's just walking very slowly, very mindfully. And then he turns back around. And the whole point was that when he turned back around and started over again, he simply forgot that God was present. That was his spiritual practice, to remember each moment. God is present. Another part of this reframe that I wrote here is that we are not bodies with desires. We are spiritual beings with bodies experiencing our desires. I thought that perhaps you and I could order a bunch of t-shirts that say, no vacancy, no vacancy, <laughs> occupied, full occupancy by God. Yes. Is that pretty good? No vacancy. Usually when we're driving down the road and we see a sign on a motel that says no vacancy, it's just like, oh, darn. But this is like a good thing. Full occupancy by God. And how do we do that? We keep God in consciousness. Read some, pray more, think about God all the time. It's what Yogananda said as far as practice. And I really, I have to make a, a little bit of a plug for this movie, Awake, coming up. If you haven't seen Awake, it is so beautiful, so masterfully done. I hope we can all see it together. So the way out is the way through. And the way out isn't about escapism. It's not about escapism. It's about an examination of life. It's an examination of consciousness so that we create space within consciousness for God to be more and more present. And I'll just say that my path has been one of increasing increasing presence. I feel it as frequencies coming in here. I feel it as body rushes and inspiration and strength to do what I need to do. This is all available to all of us. There's no exceptions to the rule. God does not respect anyone any more than anybody else. And I wrote down here, and I just want to quote it. You and I are coming to a place where our stand within the truth teachings of the world's faith says, that's enough. Enough foolishness, enough harm to ourselves and others, enough harming the planet, enough harming animals, forests. Enough. Do you feel that way? Enough. 
So in closing, I just want to say, if you're going through hell, keep going. Because God is present. Thank you.